Momentum-based games are really fun to play, but also notoriously difficult to develop. And why is that? Well, you might say the mechanics might be really difficult to make, but there's also another side to the game. You need to build levels, geometry, and a world. Let's say I created a two kilometer long corridor and put that in a game like The Last of Us. You could expect to get anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes of gameplay, filling it with enemies, collectibles, and story elements. But if you take that same two kilometer stretch and put it in a game like Sonic Unleashed, all of a sudden, that 30 minutes of playtime has reduced all the way down to 40 seconds. And when you consider that a game needs to be longer than a few minutes long for people to pay money for it, it starts to become a problem. And you might be thinking, well, hold on a second, Raymond. Aren't you making a momentum-based game? Why, yes, I happen to be. And I'm facing a lot of these problems myself. So in this devlog episode, I'm gonna be talking about how I've tried to mitigate these challenges, give some insight into my level design process, and share some of the things I've learned along the way. A lot of people ask me what tools I use to do what I do. In addition to my game engine and my modeling program, my main tool set is the Adobe Creative Cloud. I've been using Creative Cloud for years to create concept art and to create these videos. But Ray, Adobe Creative Cloud costs money. Well, if you are a student or teacher, you can get up to 60% off your next yearly plan. Just use the link in my video description. So in the last Devlock episode, we talked about the development of the new momentum-based movement mechanics. The thing is, after I developed those mechanics, I learned that I would have to redesign a lot of my levels to suit this new movement system. And I figured now might be a good time to try a completely new level built with these systems in mind and with more of my goals for what I'd like to see in the project in the long term. So I made this brand new map called Calder's Mission. And to talk about this map, I'll need to introduce you to the game's first NPC. Everybody meet Calder. Calder is a talented mechanic who also happens to be a polar bear. He needs to collect parts for his workshop, but he is too fat and lazy to do it himself. I'm not fat, it's this fur that makes me look big. So he enlists the help of Gabby to do it for him. And by using Gabby's parkour moveset and dodging obstacles, she must collect all of the pieces and return back to Calder before he gets impatient. So that's the new mission. And I will say that so far during this project, developing maps has been the most challenging part for me. There are so many options and different types of levels you can make. And the hard part is, is that it's not very obvious on paper what approach is the right approach. You kind of just have different battles that you have to fight and whatever choice you end up making, you're gonna have challenges. And it really comes down to just deciding what kind of challenges you want to deal with. Previously in the project, I had worked on a few different types of maps. In late 2020, I spent time making a linear style map that played like a wipeout course set in a shipping yard. And then I made another map, which was a bit more open-ended in nature, set in a train station. Now, while these maps may not make it into the final game, they did teach me a lot about the kinds of challenges I would have to face depending on the kind of map I wanted to build. And what I learned was making the linear style maps was the most difficult. After I released the map, I saw players get through this map in under two minutes, with some players getting through it in under 50 seconds. With the open-ended train station map, it took me only three weeks to block out, but I managed to create two missions using the same environment. I made a collectathon style mission and a checkpoint race mission. And with those two maps combined, I saw players spend an average of five minutes in this environment. Some players would even spend up to 40 minutes in this map, just exploring the environment and testing the limits of Gabby's abilities. And I think it was clear to me from seeing all of that, that it was the open style of map that I wanted to go with. And while it presents its challenges, I think those are the sort of battles I would prefer to fight. So once I was finished with the new momentum-based movement, I started working on an all-new map with an open-ended style design. And the thing that was going through my head as I was making this map was how could I make the most gameplay out of the smallest space possible? So when I started to build this map, I faced a lot of trouble. It took me a long time to actually come up with a layout that I was happy with. And the reason why I think I struggled is because I didn't have the right methodology to go about making new maps. Previously in the project, I've tried this technique borrowed from Respawn Entertainment, which they used for the Titanfall campaign. And this technique is called action blocking. And action blocking describes this process where 
you create these short, small, abstract spaces that give the players something fun to use the mechanics for. And while I think this works in certain games, I had a lot of difficulty implementing this approach in my game. This time what I decided to do was allow the game's world and story to inspire the level design instead of the other way around. Because up until this point I was trying to create abstract layouts that perfectly facilitated the mechanics and then thinking of ideas for story and missions after the fact. But doing this is quite difficult because when you have a blank canvas just nothing was coming to me. I couldn't come up with any sort of layout that I thought was interesting. So starting from the story first and thinking about what kind of scenarios could I put Gabby in and what would be fun and exciting, then the ideas started flowing and everything just sort of set in motion. And this did require that I go back and change the story a little bit because up until this point, while I haven't talked much about the story, I have been working on it. So once I spent a bit of time deciding on things about the story, like the characters and the premise and the challenges that I wanted Gabby to face, I then took that high level idea and broke it down into missions. One of those missions was Calder's mission, whereupon Gabby must help this talented mechanic collect parts around the city. And having that inspiration really sped things up. This map, with blocking out, meshing, lighting and polish, took only two weeks to complete which is much quicker than the previous maps I had done up until this point. So once I had an idea for the story and context I wanted this mission to take place in, I started getting reference images together of the kind of feeling that I wanted to go for. So I got lots of pictures of warehouses and buildings to create a coherent mood and style. Once I had that established, I then started blocking out the level using Unreal's BSP blocking tools. And this only took about two days to complete. And at this point, the map doesn't look like much, but I did have a playable layout that Gabby could navigate. Once I had that in place, I was then able to populate this block out with meshes. This time I did things a bit differently because in my previous map, the Skyport, I spent months of my own time building my own assets to use. And while that was an interesting learning experience to do, I felt that it wasn't a sustainable strategy as a solo indie dev going forward. So I took the time to look at what the Unreal Marketplace had to offer and find something that suited the project best. And I found this construction site pack that I would then go on to use to populate this map with geometry. And once I had done that, I then spent a bit of time investing into look development. Because one of the challenges with my game, of course, is its art style. It's not necessarily a realistic style, it's more of an anime style. I didn't have a lot of time to spend in this area for this build, but I did try and invest a bit of time into how I could use lighting and post-processing to make these assets look more anime. Now there's lots of ways you can do this. One idea I've had occur to me is to replace these models textures with my own hand painted textures. However, I was interested in finding a way that was quicker and more efficient to pull off. While hand painting textures would obviously give me the look I would want, I believe there's probably a way to nail that look without having to hand paint every texture. So I did invest some time into getting a nice set of post processing filters from the marketplace as well. And I was able to make use of things like Kuwahara filters and different levels of bloom and all of that stuff to try and get that look without having to retexture everything. And that about describes the development process of this map. Now overall this map doesn't reflect the exact look I'm going for. This is just the best I was able to do in the two weeks I had to work on it. But I think in terms of progress, it is a good step forward in the direction I want to go in. What I'd like to do in future is to take what I've learned from this map and continue iterating until I end up with something I'm happy with. But that's what I've got for the moment. Now I didn't just make a new map for this build. While I was working on the momentum based movement mechanics, I was secretly working on another set of level mechanics. And these are things like obstacles that I could place into any level to make the levels more fun and challenging to navigate. So with these obstacles, I started with the most fundamental of them all, which was the moving platform. Now the moving platform was interesting to make because with anything that I program, I try my best to make it flexible and reusable so that I can take the code I write and use it in other parts of the project. So while I could have made a simple platform that moved from A to B, I decided to go a bit more in depth. I started by creating this type of asset that I could place into the world that would give me a vector path that I could visualize. I can then tell the moving platform to follow that vector path in the world, with the vector path being a simple array of vectors. And once I got the basics down with the platform being able to move from point A to point B, I added a few more properties. I can tell it how fast to move and I can tell it how it should follow that path when it reaches the end. Does it go back to the beginning of the path? 
Does it stop where it is, or does it go backwards along the path the way it came? And the neat thing about this platform is that I can give it these properties for each point along the vector path. So for example, I could tell it to move really slowly to point A, and then wait for two seconds, and then move really quickly to point B, and then immediately to point C. So while it took a bit more time to program than a simple A to B path, I think it does give me much more flexibility with how I can use this obstacle. So once I had implemented that, I moved on to the next thing. I had the idea of making breakable platforms, and it turns out this was especially easy to add because in the game I've made everything with these actor components, with these self-contained behaviours, and I learned that all I needed to do was take the health component that I had already written for Gabby and the non-playable characters and add it to the platform and tell it to take damage whenever Gabby touched it. And as a result, I have a platform now that breaks whenever Gabby touches it. Now at the moment, there's no visual feedback yet for when the platform breaks, and that's something I plan on adding later. But the underlying functional logic is there, and it works. It, it actually works perfectly. The next thing I decided to work on was a spinning blade fan obstacle, and I thought this would be fun to add because it kind of makes Gabby time her movement so that she has to pass through the gaps of the spinning blade without getting damaged. Creating this was quite simple. All I did was put three cubes together in an actor, told each part of the collision to deal damage to anything it touched, and then added a rotator component, which would then rotate the spinning blades. And then I just placed them into the level and I have spinning blade obstacles. And for each one of these, I can tell it how fast to rotate. So I can have really easy blades or I can have really fast blades that are really challenging to navigate. The next thing I worked on was a laser grid obstacle. Because I had already made the moving platform component earlier, all I had to do was create a bit of geometry that looked like a laser beam. So getting a square and adding a red glowing material onto it and telling that collision to do damage to anything it touched. And then once I had that, I just put the moving platform component on it and set it to move at certain points in the world. And then you put some of them in a grid arrangement and all of a sudden you've got a laser grid. So I didn't really have to type any new code for this obstacle either because it was just all using the code I had written for the moving platform. And these were perhaps my favourite obstacles to use because they're very flexible. You can put these laser beams anywhere you want essentially and I thought it added an extra dimension of challenge to these levels that wasn't there previously. The next thing I worked on after all of that was the flashing obstacle component. And what that essentially does is it will turn obstacles on and off on a timed interval. So not only could you use these for moving platforms, whereupon the platforms could activate and deactivate on a set timer, but you can also use these for the laser grids as well, or anything for that matter. So those are all the new level mechanics, and I have all of those implemented in the new level, and also I've gone back and implemented them in some of the older levels as well for people who want to play around in those. And that is the story of how I've tried to tackle this challenge of creating fun environments for a momentum-based game, trying to make a smart use of the space I have. So while it's not close to done yet, I think it's a good step forward. So I have this new map available in the last build of the game I released, and I would very much appreciate your feedback on not necessarily the graphics, but more so how the level plays and whether or not the geometry lends itself well to the new momentum system. All in all, this took about four to five weeks to put together, including all of the planning, concepting, having the mission ideas, putting the map together, lighting it, and implementing the dynamic obstacles. I also spent some time writing my own music to have in the background for this map, and that was quite a fun process, but I'll talk more about that in a future devlog. And in case you don't know, I actually streamed a lot of this progress on my Twitch channel. I've made a habit of streaming weekly, so while I might not be putting out devlogs very frequently, I am streaming there quite often, so if you want to get an idea of what the real, unedited, gritty development process looks like for this game, then go check out my Twitch channel, link to the video description. I would love to see you there. And if you want to see where this project goes next, remember to like the video, subscribe, and follow the project on social media. I want to give a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters for getting me through this project. If you'd like to support the work I do on this game and get some exclusive perks in return, such as access to my Discord server or exclusive Project Feline merch, then check out my Patreon linked in the video description. If you'd like to submit your own fan artwork and have it featured on one of my videos, then submit it to the Project Feline 
Coffee Line subreddit linked down below. But with that said, there's still more work from this year to cover, and I will talk to you guys about that in the next devlog.